So inspection and testing. Some of the numbers have changed. <gasps> That's it. They've just changed the number. It used to be 61, it's now 63. It used to be 62, it's now 64. It's just some number changes. If any of you guys are working in colleges or writing specs, if you're quoting a reg, just make sure you've checked the number. The number has changed. That's a big alteration, but not a significant change for us. But they have added a few extra bits in. There's this thing about additions or alterations shall comply. That's always been in chapter 13. We've always had that requirement. They've just put a little note in the inspection and testing section to say the same as well. And this one seems fairly sensible to me, but they've had to put a regulation to it to check the polarity at origin because it won't be the first time the polarity is the wrong way around. We've never actually had to do that in theory, but we mostly do. But it's just asking you to ensure that the polarity is checked at origin. Seems sensible enough? Yeah? Right, quick question for you guys. How many of you sat there and when you started your apprenticeship and said, do you know what, I'd love to be an electrician, I love paperwork, Few. Would you like to see the number of boxes on the schedule of inspections on an electrical installation certificate reduced? So the number of boxes on the electrical installation certificate, do you think there's too many? Would you like to see them reduced? Yes? <laughs> no? <laughs> there's a bit of a loaded question for us. We, uh, we, we've been asking this because ECA have got a theory that there's too many boxes on there. It's four pages, four pages of tick boxes. All you can put is a tick or a not applicable in. Tick or not applicable. What's the point? We've got a suggestion going into the committee that work the wiring regs to say, that's too many. Four pages of tick boxes, all for a nice list. Fabulous to have a list to check through. This is what I'm inspecting. But does ticking it really make it better? Is it not just better to have the list to refer to? Is it not just better to reference it rather than have all those ticks? One tick at the end saying, I have inspected this installation and it complies. Because you can't put a cross in, you've got to put just ticks or not applicable. We did this a um, couple of weeks ago on uh, Monday in Weybridge and everybody in the room put their hand up and then no, one person sort of halfway through put his hand up. I quite like the boxes. Turns out he was the chairman of the panel that writes the schedule of inspections. But it was nice for him to see the industry view that actually there's too many boxes and it doesn't really make the installation better. Hopefully. We can only ask, we can only put in the proposal. But again, if you see a draft for public comment and there's a proposal in there to reduce the number of boxes, hopefully we'll get your vote. And that's it for inspection and testing. Nothing major, nothing large. Few number changes, polarity at origin is probably your main part. So, special occasions. There has been a few changes here. And a special occasion in the regs is somewhere that is over and above the existing regs. So it's a location where you have to do a little bit more. The common one that we all tend to work in at some point or be around is a bathroom. Very little has changed in terms of bathrooms. Still exactly the same as it was before, still got the zones, still can't fit a socket more than, uh, closer than three meters, and it's pretty much the same. Plenty of RCDs. Construction sites, pretty much the same. Apart from previously, we were allowed to put an armored on the ground and leave it. Now they've asked to have additional protection on that armored in case one of those things decides to run over it. Common sense, I would have thought. Most of the time we were doing it anyway, but it's just clarified it. There's gonna be a lot of this on this section. Caravan parks, a few changes, a few RCDs. Mostly it's the same as before. If you're doing a caravan park, it's essentially the same, just with a little bit more information in. Hasn't really altered what you do. Medical locations though, there's been a few tweaks in that one. Change that. That little table, which was always very useful, I thought, has been took out. And there is a statement to say, particularly in group two locations, so where you're open and having an operation, do not fit an AFDD. Do not in group two locations, in medical locations. So nice and clear, not to. It's not a risk assessment, it's not to. 
Installations within caravans themselves, again, pretty much the same as before. A few tweaks with RCDs and a few changes to some bonding requirements, but nigh on the same as before. This one, however, has changed. And a couple of guys at the back and at the middle put their hands up saying that they were doing EVs um, quite a bit. It will be a growing market. There will be more of them being requested, more than being fitted. And whether or not you like electric vehicles or whether you want one, it is gonna be a growing area. We're gonna to have to fit more of them. The previous regs, the yellow one, used to say a phrase, and I'm paraphrasing here, whatever you do, don't fit PME, unless it's a bit difficult and you can't be bothered, was kind of what it said. Now they've removed that, unless it's a bit difficult bit. And it's very, very, very difficult to feed an electric vehicle with PME. There are a few options that you can do. One of them is to fit a device that doesn't exist, not gonna do that very often, but it's very, very difficult to fit PME for an electric vehicle. And it talks about having specific types of RCDs, which we mentioned earlier. If you're fitting an electric vehicle charging point, a type A or type B RCD will be required. And somebody shouted out 100 quid difference. That could be your profit. Make sure you've got the right type. But that second bullet point is important as well. I was doing this chat with some wholesalers a couple of weeks ago, and I said, do you know the socket, 13 amp socket, do you know how much current it's designed to pull? And they all went, 13 amps. No, it's not. It's not allowed to pull 13 amps for a prolonged period of time. It can take 13 amps for a short time, like your kettle. But it's not supposed to pull 13 amps for a long period of time. But you plug an EV in, and it's gonna pull 13 amps for eight, nine, 10 hours. If you're fitting a 1363 socket outlet for an electric vehicle, it should be stamped on the back with EV. And you think, well, oh, is that just for marking? Is that just for indication? No, they are made differently. They are beefier, bigger, stronger connections, better quality inside. If you are doing new build houses, where all new build houses have to have a point for an electric vehicle, don't fit an ordinary 1363 socket. Fit one that is EV compliant. Otherwise, it won't be the right socket. And when I was chatting to the wholesalers a couple of weeks ago, there was a lady at the front went, um, I've got an electric vehicle at home. I've just got it plugged into an ordinary socket. Well, you might want to change it. How many people are aware that there's an EV stamp on the back of a socket? It really wasn't common. There must have been 30 different wholesalers in the room. Not one of them stocked it. Makes life easy for us. Um, so if you're fitting a 1363 socket for an electric vehicle, it must be one stamped EV compliant. And it is, as I say, it's very difficult to PME an electric vehicle, so most of the times you have to segregate it and divorce the earth from the PME to the outside. But there is another way. In your yellow book, it talks about all the options for emitting um, PME. But then you turn the page over and you go halfway down. There's another option. And because we don't turn the page over and look halfway down, it's, it's easily missed. Which well, is a thing called a safety isolating transformer. And it's a, a genuinely good idea. This is a picture courtesy of a company called Ludo McGurk who makes safety isolating transformers. And they make them for the ambulance, the fire service, the police. And what they are designed to do is isolate the earth from A to B, second and primary side. So in theory, I mean, don't try this, but in theory, you could go there, touch that brown cable, and not get a shock, because there's no return path. You might get a little tingle through uh, capacitive coupling, but in theory, it's totally electrically isolated, and you cannot get an electric shock. You have divorced the earth from the PME system without need for an earth rod. And I was chatting to a guy who was um, fitting some of these for a client who had some Teslas, or a Tesla, and it was a very nice house and it was a very nice drive and he did not want to see an earth rod anywhere. So he fitted an isolating transformer. The, the, the bulky, the 300 quid, there or thereabouts and obviously the take up room. But if somebody spent 120 grand on a Tesla, 300 quid for one of them might avoid the hassle of putting an earth rod in, testing it, maintaining it and looking after it. Safety isolating transformer was always an option and it still is an option in the 18th, and it's a genuine option, it's a good option, and it's something that you might find is a useful thing to fit. Um, 
just on that as well, if any of you guys are doing uh, electric vehicles, there's no requirement in 722 to fit surge protection devices. But I was speaking to somebody who, again, I think it was Tesla. Their client suffered a lightning stroke and it damaged the charger. Tesla said they will replace it once. If you do not fit a lightning, uh, a surge protection device to our charger, we will only replace it once. It's not part of the regs, but if you're fitting EVs, check what the manufacturer's instructions say. Because if the manufacturer's instructions say the client must fit an SPD, it's what you've got to do. Not in the regs, but it's worth checking out. Oh, hang on. Onshore units of electrical shore connections for inland navigation vessels. I don't know about you, but you can't move for them in Mar Street. Oh. Narrow boats, kind of. It's a charging point that goes on a river or a canal for feeding one of these units. If you're doing this, you're probably quite specialized, you know what you're doing anyway. It's ever so similar to the harbors and marinas section, but it is a brand new special occasion. And just as a bit of a tip, the numbers, they aren't always sequ sequential. They don't all go one after the other. That means there's a gap. Possibly there might be something coming in the future, possibly from the IEC to fill those gaps. Special occasions are above and beyond the standard body of the regs. I honestly can't tell you why we've adopted this. I have no idea. But if you are working in, hang on, onshore units of electrical shore connections for inland navigation vessels, which is obviously a very catchy title, you will be doing this sort of stuff anyway. You'll know what's happening. It is harbors and marinas with a few extra tweaks. And floor and ceiling. Does anybody fit electric underfloor heating frequently? Few people. Did you know there's a special certificate for electric underfloor heating? It's been in there for oh, probably 10 years. It's just information about the size and shape and where it's connected and what type of heating system it is. And it's in section 753, and it says fill out this form. It's not a model certificate like is in BS 7671 in EICs, EICRs, and things like that, but it's just an information sheet. And in theory, if you buy some matting from a wholesaler, they provide that data sheet, and you fill it in. It's a special certificate that goes with the underfloor heating section. They've expanded it to include outside heating and frost prevention now, and they've grown it. So if you are doing electric underfloor heating, make sure you've got the right form to fill out for your client. It's been there for a while, but most people tend to just miss over it. And that's it for special occasions. There are, like I said at the start, there are some areas that you guys will no doubt work in that we've missed out, but we're trying to give you a bit of an overview. On an overview, the appendices. Appendix one is normative. I read that and I went and got my dictionary for turgid. And then appendix, the rest of them are informative. Appendix one is a list of all the British standards that are relevant to 7671. So Matt mentioned 8519. We've talked a little bit about fire alarms and emergency lighting, 58395266, all slightly separate. 7671 is one tool in the toolbox. There are lots of other regs and standards that we work with. Appendix one is, in, is normative. The rest of them are informative. They're not mandatory. They're just there for information. So the part that says about volt drop being three and 5% is in the appendices. It's informative. The reg says basically enough voltage to fire the load. So if you drop four or 6%, you haven't broken a reg because it's in the appendix. So part one, or appendix one is normative, must be done, the rest of them are just for information. Appendix six has got your model certs in. And because we're a trade association, we're your trade association, we're here for you, what we've done is took the model certs and made them editable, digital, on our website. And you can download them, fill them in, print them off. Guess how much they cost? Free. There's a theme, there's a theme here. All 7671, 5266, 5839, and a whole raft of other certificates are on our website. I'll be honest with you, they aren't as good as a four, 500 pound piece of software. There's no intelligence built into them. They'll not check your breaker against the maximum ZS and whatnot. But if you want something free, quick, 
easy. You can get access to our 7671 forms. Who, out of interest, has used them in the past? Fair few guys, yeah? Was there any problems with them before? Yes. Yeah? What's that? You can email them. You email them? Yeah, you can save them as a PDF and you should be able to email them. What was that? Didn't line up. We've changed them all. So they are editable PDFs now. Nice, simple software. Best thing that you do is update your PDF reader, Adobe, Foxit. We've also added another sheet of paper that instead of having to schedule test results that way, which only had 12 ways on or something, we've got that and we've also got it that way. So it's got 30 odd ways on it. So if you're doing a bigger install, you should be able to use them, email them, line them up properly because they've all been tweaked and um, redone. They're all brand new forms. Get on the website, download them, use them. Free of charge, they're there for you. Appendix 14 talks about not necessarily needing to do a prospective short current test in a dwelling. So in a dwelling, in theory, you've got a board with a conditional rate and a 16K. Do you need to do a fault current test? That's all it's saying. Don't have to. So you can mark on your certificate, inquired, 16K, board conditional rate, and something like that. It doesn't prohibit you from doing it. And to be quite frank, ZE, it doesn't stop you. It just says, do you need to do it? And if you don't need to do it, then you certainly don't have to. This is a big one, or nearly. It was proposed there shall be a brand new part to 7671 part eight, energy efficiency. It hasn't made it. It's now an informative appendix, number 17. But it's almost certain that this will develop into part eight, energy efficiency, later on. So when amendment one, amendment two, whatever version of it comes out, there will be some more information about energy efficiency. And it is informative. It is for information. It is to give your client the option to design an installation based not on electrical functionality or not on electrical safety only. It's about designing it with energy efficiency in mind. So a bigger cable that produces less heat, which means the air con has to run a little bit less. Great idea, fabulous idea. Guess what it comes down to? Money. And you can give your client the option to design anything you want. You can install gold cables if you wish, if they're willing to pay for it. Energy efficiency is just there to give you the option to design an installation to last longer, be less wasteful for energy, and in theory, pay back the client over a long period of time. But it hasn't made it as part eight. It is just an informative appendix, and it is just for information. But it will likely come as part eight. And that's it for the appendices, nice and easy. Now we're on to the good one. When we first started doing these talks on the draft for public comment, a year or so ago, I generally hid behind something for most of the event because somebody no, always gets blamed, and it was usually me. But I can quite happily stand here now because I can show you this. As it stands, there is no requirement for an existing QS to obtain the 18th edition qualification. If you are part of the registered electrician scheme, you will need to obtain it by the 1st of July 2019. If you want to get it, absolutely great idea. I will thoroughly endorse getting a qualification. But there is no mandatory requirement to have an 18th for an existing QSs. New QSs, yes. But all of you in this room are a company that is assessed one way, shape, or form. When that guy comes out to do your assessment, have you got an 18th qualification? No, but I have got an adequate knowledge because I attended the ECA event. I read the guidance. I've read the book. Ask me any question you like about the 18th. You do not have to have a current edition of the qualifications. Good news, bad news? Useful news. It means if you want to, you certainly can, and anybody who's involved in design is a really good idea to get it. But as a larger company, you don't have to send everybody on it immediately. You can take your time. You can spread it out. You can spread the cost. 
There's multiple ways as well of getting the qualification. You can walk into a center and say, I would like to be an external candidate. 50 pound, I'll just do the exam. You can do that. ECA have teamed up with JTL and Searcher to offer an online training course as well. You can speak to your regional managers and if you can get 15 or so people in a room, they will arrange the training at a massively discounted rate for you. But currently, no existing QS needs to get the qualification. I'm not gonna say it's, um, it's a bad idea, because I think it's a great idea. Go and get it if you can. But don't feel you have to rush out. Get some guides, get some info, have a look on our website. We've got a lot of guides on there. And guess how much they are? Free. Download them. We mentioned about other guides as well. Make sure you get the right ones though. Don't download anything that's related to uh, the draft for public comment, because that isn't the case anymore. It's not about that. Make sure you get the right guides. But we can help you in other ways. We can do things like this. We can do talks and you can get CPD and we can give you information. When it comes to things like desk study, we've got some software that will do a desk study for you. and We'll produce you uh, discrimination selectivity analysis. We've also got our test certificates that we, uh, we mentioned earlier and access to all sorts of other test certificates. We've partnered up with Beamer as well who produce really, really good guides. Again, free, Beamer website. Our website, there'll be a link to them. Lots of really, really useful information. If anybody wants to buy any more copies of the book, you certainly can do. You can buy some off us today, you can get some from your wholesalers, you can get some online. If you want to use the IET's online digital package, really good, but as an ECA member, you get 20% off that. So if you're using it without getting your 20% discount, have a word with your RM, we'll get you that discount sorted. And you can use our ERAM software. Does anybody use that? A couple of guys? Oh, quite a few. An electronic risk assessment and method statement software. I was chatting with a company a couple of weeks ago. They spent 1,500 quid a year on their risk assessment software. Started using ours. Guess how much? Free. It's a really, really good, useful, handy little package. And Matt threw up BS8519 earlier. 5266 changed the other year, 5839 is changing now, part one changed last year. 250 quid each, those standards. If you're using any other British standards, we've got 80 of them for 100 quid. Each one on its own is worth 250 quid. So if you're going out and buying British standards, don't. Have a word with us, have a word with member services. We'll tell you how to get the online service to get the access to the other standards. 7671 is just one tool in the toolbox. Use all the others and make sure you get them. And finally, if you think that you want to ask any questions later, on the drive on the way home over the weekend, if you think, ah, what, what was he on about there? What did he say? Give us a call. Drop us an email, project18 at eca.co.uk. Get in touch with us. Ask us some questions. Give us some comments. Give us some feedback. If you think a reg is a bad idea, let us know, because then we can take that to the committees on your behalf. That phone number, 4833, eca.co.uk, project18 at eca.co.uk. Get in touch with us, drop us some emails, drop us some uh, feedback, because it is massively appreciated.